Okay, uh, maybe we should go ahead and uh, get started. It uh, looks like uh, many may be staying at home or in their offices and tying it via webcast. Uh, good afternoon uh, and welcome to our Permit Streamlining Task Force Subcommittee meeting. It's our first meeting of the year. I'm lucky to solve this. Perhaps we can go around with the self introductions. Yeah. Uh, Bill Pierce, Boeing. Bill Lamar, Executive Director of the California Small Business Alliance. Uh, Brian Stromar, Senior Admin, AQMD. All right, I am. Hi, Angelina, Senior Admin. David Rothbart, Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts. David Ono, Supervising Air Quality Engineer. Uh, Amir Desbach, Assistant DEO, EMP. And we have several staff members from uh, EMP predominantly. Let's start with Mitch. Uh, Mitch Hemlov, uh, Coatings and Permitting Line. David Howe from the Permit Streamlining Group. Uh, Andrew Lee in the Energy and Waste Management Group. Angela Shibata in the Waste Management Permitting. Dana Lau from Reclaim Admin and um, Refining Group. Okay. Uh, Sarah Yan, Orange County Sanitation District. Oh, uh, Dana Maxey, Inspector with the District Office. Peter Allen, Chevron. Janice West with the Streamlining District. Tom Lee. ACC and Elvira with ACC. And the Gold Machine 25. And a rose. Bill Strauss with AQMD Permit Stream Management. Alan, no, I've never been asked to be Dr. Bass. When I saw you with the AI, I go, who's this guy? <laughs> okay, very good. Welcome all. Uh, so uh, let's dive right into uh, our agenda. So, what we want to do is uh, give you a status report on where we are with our backlog reduction effort and with the uh, online tool development efforts of ours and what we are planning to do at our next phase. And uh, just joining us is uh, around with uh, our information management. Uh, and then at the end, we want to talk, we want to start the dialogue on the expedited permit processing. Uh, several of you have brought up the issue in the past. They wanted us to take a look at the program. So we just want to um, uh, open the dialogue, uh, and uh, I'm sure we are going to be agendizing this item, uh, if it's still an issue, uh, in our subsequent meetings, um, and um, uh, take it from there. So uh, let me very quickly uh, go over, provide you with the status report on where we are with our backlog production efforts. As you know, uh, we started those efforts um, almost um, a year and a half to two years ago in uh, July of uh, um, 2016. And we are doing pretty uh, pretty well so far. We had established uh, ourselves a 50% reduction uh, goal. And I'm happy to announce as of, as of last week, we were at 49%. So we are one percentile point away from uh, hitting our targets. So we are on track, uh, and of course, we don't want to stop at our target. We want to go further beyond that and establish a cushion if we can, uh, because we are cognizant of, um, uh, of the reclaim phase out and the impacts that will come along with it. We anticipate um, uh, an influx of additional uh, applications that we normally don't get. So establishing a cushion uh, to uh, minimize that impact uh, would be uh, a smart thing uh, for us to do, so and we are going to uh, strive for that. So, uh, so uh, lucky that yes. that's forty nine percent or fifty percent halfway through the seven thousand three hundred and sixty eight exactly. or whatever that number yes. was. Yes, yes, uh -huh. and that was our target, basically our two year target. So we are ahead of target, ahead of time, and frankly, we are going under budget. You know, so so we are pretty happy so far. You know, with. Uh, with where we are. So just to show you, these were basically our roadmap. Uh, we were what we were supposed to do, you know, in uh, two years. And basically, um, we were able to outperform our targets each and every quarter. Uh, and like I said, you know, hopefully by the end of this month or certainly early next month, we'll be able to um, uh, cross the finish line. Um, so. Uh, we have also started uh, as of, uh, when was it, um, at the beginning of the fiscal year, uh, of this fiscal year, we started tracking uh, the uh, total pending applications as well as um, uh, the remaining pending applications, excluding the permits to construct issued, because the permits to construct issued can serve uh, as a temporary permits to operate 
we are totally dependent on our customers, on uh, our stakeholders to, um, uh, to um, construct their equipment, source test them, uh, provide those reports to us before we are able to issue the uh, permit to operate. So, uh, and if you do that math, um, uh, basically our remaining pending applications, which reflects our total inventory, is uh, roughly above, uh, slightly above the 2,500, which are numbers that we have never seen before in the last 30 years. So we are in pretty decent shape. And if you look at the very last pair, the very last column of the 2,500 remaining, there's still room for improvement. There is a red zone there uh, that has approximately, I can't see that far, close to 500 or so uh, permit applications. Uh, I don't know whether we can eliminate all of them because some of those old dogs, you know, they are basically mission impossible, you know, to uh, deal with. But we think, you know, we can uh, trim that a little bit further and we'll try. Uh, the only thing, I, I can share this with you guys, uh, because those are the, the last remaining ones, and by the way, this is 80% lower than what it was when we started a year and a half ago in July 2016. Um, they have taken an exorbitant amount of time uh, to uh, try to deal with. And while we have a little bit extra time to work on those, we don't want that to take away uh, from our ability to process uh, the newly income and permit. So it's a fine balancing act that uh, uh, we'll have to do. Uh, yes, uh, Bill. Are, are some of these, uh, uh, you've got 562 greater than two years. Yes. Are some of those reclaim permits? Uh, reclaim, non-reclaim, Title V, it's a mixed bag. So, so some of those, if they're reclaimed, they will go away then, right? Well, it doesn't matter uh, if, if they want. Well, the, but then they'll transform to some other type of permit. By, and, and possibly even more with individual equipment right. rather than Right, so uh, just to give you an idea, uh, look at that 2,500 number. So in Reclaim, we have um, roughly 260 facilities and operating roughly 2,400 equipment. So the impact that we are going to have at the best case scenario will be the minimum 260, at the maximum will be 2,400. So we are trying to figure out different ways internally we are brainstorming to minimize that impact. The impact there will be, though we won't be able to avoid the impact altogether, but we are trying to minimize it. So we are thinking that if we can establish a cushion, it may take part of the um, uh, uh, impact. Uh, so we'll see how successful we are. But we have to be um, uh, ready and face it. You know, we know it's coming. So uh, our Actually, yes, yeah, yes. just a quick question on that, and I, and I asked in context of the proposed rule three hundred one. Mm -hmm. um, did I read it correctly? Are you allowing facilities to make a choice of whether to keep their facility permit or convert everything to standalone permits? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, the short answer is yes. Uh, that choice, that option, will be there. But in an ideal world, uh, just to minimize uh, the impact at the initial stage of the phase out, we want people to maintain uh, their facility permits. So the fee schedule that we proposed on the Reg 3 basically uh, tells you how much that will cost to take the reclaim permit, sanitize it off the uh, reclaim references, uh, the reclaim taggings and convert it to a non reclaim facility permit. Now, if you want to convert the facility permit to equipment-specific permits, there's another provision. You can do that. It's going to cost you a little bit more. Uh, but ideally, you don't have to do it. But right. No, I just, and I only asked that. I didn't realize it was even going to be offered as a choice. We are giving you that option because I don't, we don't think we can take that option away from you, to be frank with you. Okay. All right? Uh, but, um, you know, knowing the bottlenecks, you know, and knowing how big the task is, we'll try to discourage or encourage people, you know, to retain the facility permits, at least at the initial stage. You know, a year or two years later, you know, they, you want to dismantle it, you know, and go to an equipment-specific contract, 
No problem. We can help you out with that. So our process rates are uh, pretty, we are maintaining pretty high processing rates. So in this slide, we are comparing application inflows to applications process indicated with the green bar and the applications, incoming applications are indicated uh, with the yellow ones. And we are looking at six month increments. So we started uh, holding the statistics since 2015 when we started um, our backlog deduction effort in mid of 2016, as you can see, we were able to uh, start uh, improving our production rates and process a lot more applications compared to uh, the incoming uh, <coughs> permit applications. And this is basically what allowed us to reduce uh, the pending applications inventory. And we are maintaining a healthy balance, you know, still. And we hope that it will continue, and to the extent that it does, uh, the downward trend will continue, albeit at a slower rate compared to what it was when we started a year and a half ago. Uh, so with these kind of uh, production records, uh, we were able to exceed our total applications um, uh, process targets and uh, the permits to construct issued targets for the year by 20, 28% and 25% uh, respectively. Uh, so we are pretty happy uh, about that, um, um, uh, that record. And we initiated already an employee recognition program. We have 10 teams um, um, engaged in permit processing. So we took it upon ourselves to, um, uh, to basically recognize our MVPs and our top performance in each and every uh, team. And we intend to continue that. I'll be real quick while you're talking yeah. about that. Something uh -huh. I usually get from people trying to build a project is uh -huh. say, they always say, how long does it take to get a permit? Mm -hmm. And it's good to see the backlog. But is there any metrics that you guys keep track of how long it takes to receive and process a permit? Uh, we do. Um, we do track that. You know, we know exactly you know, how long it takes um, uh, to issue a permit. Uh, our metrics do not necessarily reflect those time uh, frames. As we graduate to more sophisticated metrics, we hope that we can introduce some timing element uh, into that. But none of these uh, does reflect that yet. Okay. It would be nice to have so even an estimate saying, here's the approximate time frame. Right. I agree. I agree. And uh, I don't want to steal Amir's thunder, but when we talk about our next phase, tool development efforts. Uh, uh, we want to develop a dashboard tool that will basically you know, answer some of that que those questions. Okay, I'm just, so I'm just going to say when, when they get going full blast on their online permitting system, yes. it should be free. To Thank you. Yes, absolutely. In, in yeah. and out. That's right. Yeah. You know, I mean, from weeks, I mean, certain permits, uh, like uh, the dry cleaning permits, for it can take, you know, weeks, it can take months. Sometimes, well, I don't want to say years, but you know, it it, sure. it, it may take quite uh, quite some time. With the online uh, processing, you can get it in thirty minutes. You know, I'm talking about more sophisticated. More sophisticated, yeah. yeah. It's case by case. It, it is case by case, case, but uh, no, I, I agree, and uh, Amir will talk a little bit about that uh, tool that we are trying to develop. So, let's see. Uh, so. Uh, we do plan, so we are happy where we are today, uh, but we are going to continue those efforts. We are not going to uh, relax. And it's an iterative process. You know, we are looking at our policies, continuously updating policies and procedures, and uh, developing more sophisticated metrics to provide, not only uh, gauge how well we are doing, but also provide some incentives to uh, our staff members. And uh, certainly, uh, we are counting on all of you guys to provide us with uh, uh, some feedback and factor those uh, uh, into, um, into our permit processing. And uh, Dave, I don't want to steal your thunder, but uh, standardizing permit conditions is something that you have been uh, advocating for a very long time. We've done some progress, but there's a lot more you know, uh, room to go. So, uh, so we are going to continue this effort. Uh, there are some key challenges, uh, of course, you know, moving forward, and some of those is, uh, we mentioned about this earlier at the presentation, uh, the remaining, uh, I'll call the red zone permits, the residual age applications, 
are extremely challenging to deal with uh, and extremely time consuming uh, to get rid of, but uh, yeah, we are cognizant of that. Uh, uh, managing the reclaim transition is going to be another challenge. Initially, when we started off, obviously that was not even on our map, uh, but now we know that we have to deal with it, and we know it's a biggie, um, but it has to be factored in in our analysis, ultimately. Um, so um, uh, we are trying to improve our permit processing through the online um, uh, tool development uh, so that we can uh, use this time to complete those permits. Uh, uh, maintain low vacancy rates, you know, will be a challenge, you know, but uh, we'll need each and every one um, uh, that we hire. Uh, we, when we started, our vacancy rate was at 22-24% in that range. We dropped it down to 12% momentarily uh, we touched the 8% uh, vacancy rate just to see it go back up to, where are we now, 13%, uh, roughly. There is some turnover, uh, retirements, people may be leaving. Uh, so it is a challenge to keep that vacancy rate uh, low, but it's, uh, it's of vital importance for us to be able to maintain our uh, production rates. And uh, it goes without saying, uh, we are... Uh, pushing our staff uh, as hard as we can, and fatigue, you know, I mean, people who are coming in working during the weekends, uh, fatigue is always an issue that we have to be cognizant of and concerned about, so we are trying to alternate, you know, weekends, uh, but, but there's... Still, it's still vol voluntary overtime, right? It is voluntary overtime, yes, uh, and it's... Uh, 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 we have some dedicated staff that do volunteer their times, and uh, they are extremely productive, uh, but it's, it's it, there's so much that you can do with the same set of people. Uh, so anyhow, it, it is something that we have to be very cognizant. So, so those staff that want a new ski boat or, <laughs> or, 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 uh, or, or, or an ATV or something like that. Uh, you know, I it. can't complain. I don't know how they are spending their money, you know, but uh, as long as they're volunteering <laughs> to uh, provide their services, uh, it's welcome. So. With that, um, uh, obviously, you all know that we are heavily, heavily invested on developing online tools, and we've made some progress, uh, and I'll have Dave to basically, and then Amir, uh, gives you a status report on where we are with that effort. So well, Dave, before, before you yes. move on, question about the policies, you're saying you're updating mm -hmm. policies? Yes. Are you planning to take policies and put them online? Of, of course, yes. So as you're doing it, Whatever that you could do to make it clear to the applicants as far as what they can expect and what the process is and make things consistent would be very helpful. Sure, 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 sure. And, and frankly, some of them may be bringing them uh, here, you know, just to use you guys uh, as a signing board and uh, get your reaction. Um, uh, and I can share with you a couple of policies that we are working on right now is... Uh, uh, we briefly talked about this, uh, collapsing the two-step permit processing, permit to construct, permit to operate, uh, down to one for a specific subset of applications. We can't do it across the board, but for some of the simpler ones, especially the ones that don't have any uh, toxic implications, we may be able to do that. Uh, the other policy that we are looking at is um, um, uh, the public... Uh, public notification, the two, Rule 212 uh, policy to, we don't have a, any de minimis level in those, and we are trying to establish some de minimis pro, um, uh, level so that not 100% of those scenarios have to go through that uh, elaborate process or labor-intensive process, and time-consuming, I should say, in our process, an expensive process and uh, for the applicant. Kind of a high priority to myself and my members, the wastewater members, is a situation where if someone goes gets a permit and there's a certain standard that's established by a certain permit, uh -huh. how do you know that from the next person in line? And it's a sort of if there's some internal determination of this is kind of the, the floor of what we're requiring, it'd yeah. be nice to be able to have that available right. to others to know what they'll have to do next time. So one thing that we wanted to do uh, almost right now at this stage of the backlog reduction effort. Then unfortunately, because of frequent, we may need to reprioritize things. Was for each of our teams, um, and we have ten, as I said. 
to take the top three, four processes that they are working on and come up with a white paper explaining, you know, those processes, you know, the standards, the de minimis conditions, how we go about in doing the permit evaluation and uh, establish um, a handbook, basically, which can replace our antiquated uh, permit uh, processing handbook that we had from 20 years ago and use that as a tool uh, to train not just our internal folks, but put it up on the internet, you know, so that you guys, you know, the stakeholders, uh, will know uh, what kind of calculation, what kind of process you go with in evaluating your permit application. I think that's it's what you're it's, asking. Right? And it's, it's even more than that as far okay. as for a certain situation, as far as this is a standard that was applied to a certain facility that may be a different approach or something required that is a different standard or methodology than was required before, that the next person may not understand, oh, I have to do this when I'm applying for a permit for X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's usually once you say, okay, this has been done for a typical unit to monitor for this or to report certain things, it's an ever sliding standard mm -hmm. that every time someone does something, it increases the bar what the next person needs to do. I see. It's that type of perspective that would be nice to know if that bar changes. Okay. Lucky, I, okay. I, I, <coughs> All right. I can't remember off the top of my head, but doesn't AB 617 require some sort of public notification? Or spell out circumstances where mm -hmm. it doesn't. Not 617. Our 212 is an all encompassing rule. And uh, just to give you a nutshell, it requires us before we issue a permit, before we propose the issuance of a permit, if the emissions impact of the permit is above seven thresholds or if it has any toxic implication, even one molecule, or if uh, it's uh, close to uh, within 1,000 feet of uh, uh, the proposed uh, permit, fac permit facility, if it's within 1,000 feet of the school, uh, to go ahead and um, uh, issue a public notice uh, 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 to all interest parties uh, around the facility. And, you know, it's normally, you know, 30 days, we have to wait for their comments. Uh, sometimes we get requests to um, to hold a public hearing. So it's uh, it's a good procedure uh, to alert the public about uh, and let them be aware of what is coming, you know, uh, to their uh, to their neighborhood. Uh, the only downside is a it takes some time. Uh, B there is a cost associated, which typically you know the uh, uh, permit holder pays, but there is no de minimis level, you know, and we are trying to establish some de minimis level. So if the proposed permit, permit modification or proposed new permit, it's below a certain uh, threshold to basically bypass this public notification process. It's not going to address, you know, 100% uh, of our permit applications, but it may allow us to um, remove a good chunk um, uh, of those uh, permit applications from uh, the process and allow us to uh, process them a lot faster. The other thing is that we are trying to figure out is uh, uh, one common bottleneck, uh, and especially with the older permits, but also with the newer permits, uh, the permit comes in, Normally we'll have 30 days, you know, to uh, deem it uh, complete, and often we'll issue, you know, a letter if we see some glaring omissions from the permit. And at some point after 30 days, it's been deemed complete. But once the engineer starts processing the permit, uh, through the uh, interaction with the applicant, uh, we're, we realize that we need a lot more information to process the permit. And often, you know, we'll put the information request uh, uh, through but there won't be any response back. Uh, and often the permit, you know, lingers, you know, the shelves, sometimes gets forgotten. A year goes uh, by, you know, a second year goes by, and all of a sudden, you know, end up, you know, with the red zone. So, uh, so we gotta figure out some common sense approach to give our applicants, you know, a reasonable time frame to respond, maybe a second chance, but if the information is not forthcoming, maybe, you know, 
to skill that in application or do something with it. Anyhow, once uh, we have some uh, suggestions, we may bring those back to you guys and try to gauge some reaction from uh, you folks. Okay. All right. You guys want to give an update on uh, our online permitting tool that we've been uh, we've mentioned last couple of meetings. Uh, I think the last update our tool was still in the uh, beta testing phase, so we're pleased to announce that it's now fully live and advertised. Uh, right here's a screenshot of our web page that shows that you can go directly in there and have links to the tool. Uh, after you create an account, you can go in and, as Lockie mentioned earlier. Uh, provides you meet the specified criteria for it, and these permits are fairly straightforward. Uh, you'd be able to go through the process and get an actual permit within a half hour, emailed uh, to the email that you provided. Uh, we were fully live at the end of uh, January, and we also introduced the new facility ID creation tool as part of that, which we think is uh, actually quite useful. And I'd like to thank you know the IAM staff uh, who put a lot of effort into getting this uh, uh, this project through to completion. Um, this is a couple of screenshots, additional screenshots from the web page. So if you go to our permitting web uh, page location, uh, over on the left, on the bottom there, a second item, you see there's a link to the online tool and a little description to it. And we also put uh, the description also in Korean because there's a large contingent that is uh, uh, the Korean speaking. But thank you very much for that. It's very helpful. Mark it out to them. And uh, also thanks for uh, Bill and Mark who got provide some of our initial test cases uh, to ensure that the process works out properly. So we have some additional modules that are still uh, in internal testing. Um, it's for automotive refinishing facilities and uh, gasoline dispensing facilities. Uh, these are Still relatively uh, uh, straightforward, not as complex as some of the other permitting units. Uh, more complicated than the dry cleaners and uh, a lot more in terms of numbers of applications that we process historically. Uh, the plan is as these get uh, ready to be deployed, they would appear on the same link as the, um, the dry cleaner module. You see uh, over on the left there'll be two additional options. This is our, our staging, our testing environment that shows what it would look like. And we're, like I said, we're going through internal testing there. And the main difference between the dry cleaning module and these two new ones is it's basically we're getting information from the traditional 400 E form. So the E17B form and the E11 form, those are the ones that are associated with those types of units. And in, in the bottom there you see on the two boxes, uh, in the dry cleaner form, it's the, the form that's associated with, I think it's E7 here it'll be replaced with the E17B and a series of uh, pages for E17B or E11 for those two types of equipment. Uh, now, because they're a little more complex, there are additional, I'll call them thresholds or criteria that is used to determine whether or not that, that application can be approved online. In the dry cleaner module, the main criteria was whether or not you're within 1,000 feet of the school because that might trigger a public notification. And then to verify that, we'd have to bring that application in-house. You can still file online, but the approval will be done through a traditional means. It would speed up the process because they'd have some uh, um, error checking as they input the, the information, but it would still have to come in-house to verify that the uh, public notice was uh, taken care of properly. For these two modules, there's some additional criteria I'll cover in the next slide. So, these, these additional rules have uh, some thresholds that are associated with it. Rule 1147, uh, you need uh, to meet certain criteria. Certified burners uh, are what we one of the criteria that is used to evaluate compliance with the 1147. Uh, to approve it online, if you're using a certified burner, then that would be an easy check. If there's something that's outside that range, of course, you need an engineer to provide some additional assistance with that process. Uh, our NSR rule, Reg 13, if their emissions are higher than a certain level, it might trigger an offset requirement, which we can't readily approve online. Uh, 1401, our top six rule in terms of risks. Uh, there, we're trying to establish some kind of screening threshold so that if you're below those levels, then it's more readily approvable online. If not, then there may be some additional evaluation uh, because what we built in some conservative assumptions and the facility's actually maybe a little farther away 
or their rates are a little bit lower than max capacity and they want to have a, a limit that was more representative of the actual operations that will require some additional processing by a district engineer. Um, the CEQA has some criteria also that might get triggered if they're below thresholds then again that could be processed online otherwise they might be pulled in and then carbon executive orders that's uh, specific to the guest and dispenser facilities a lot of those executive orders have criteria uh, conditions associated with that which may require some additional review from an, uh, from an engineer so like I said uh, uh, earlier the dry cleaning one had the public notification thresholds that still applies to these also and we're getting pretty close in terms of our internal testing. We are looking potentially for some volunteers to help us with our beta testing simulator that we did uh, with the, the dry cleaners. So kind of open ended invitation if, if you have uh, people who are interested. We, in, we, we talked in about that yeah. I don't know, a week or two ago. And I, I just said, uh, you know, if, if I can get a little time or, right. or a date, that's, that's sure. fine. We are not ready yet, but we are coming very close to that point. Um, uh, so, we think within the next few weeks we may be able to deploy those tools. We are a little bit further ahead with respect to um, the automotive spray booths than we are with the gasoline stations. We are still there are a few bugs that we are trying to uh, to resolve, but as soon as we have that one ready, um, I'll call you, Bill. I think our prior experience with the Korean Dry Cleaning Association was extremely useful, extremely yeah, yeah. useful, and we think that we can replicate it here with, uh, uh, with these applications. So, as soon as we have it ready, we are ready for prime time. I'll give you a call, and we can set the meeting up in a few weeks, um, and we can have a demo slash training, whatever we're gonna call it, and uh, we can take you uh, to the online tool just the way we did it a couple of meetings ago. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's very helpful. Yeah, useful. I think absolutely. Everyone. Yeah. Dave. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that the for the dry cleaners, it's already live. Yes. 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 How many applications or permits have been issued? Um, uh, I think uh, seven, eight, seven. Seven. Yeah, seven total. Um, which I think is in line with like a historical application inflow. Right. Yeah. So, right. Um, well, yeah, I think the bulk of the. Once the perk is being uh, not, not allowed to be used anymore under the current rules, I think there's going to be a large number of the uh, dry cleaners are going to come in and get new permits. So we're going to see well, they, a lot they, more they activity. To, they have to go 2020. Right. So and, in about two years. I think you're right. going to get some diehard holdouts, Bill. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They're, they're going yeah, like to sit till the very last uh, moment. Yeah. I, it's within our expectations. Yeah. So the way we are implementing the tool, it applies only to the brand new uh, installations right now. Uh, but once they're in the system and we have the underlying electronic information, it will also apply in the future to permit modifications. As we populate, you know, the... You know. So, anyway. but, but for most dry cleaners, it's just going to be a replacement. Right. They're not right, going to right, modify. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> Um, and to give you kind of a flavor, uh, and the handouts is easier, <clears throat> you can see a little more uh, detail. Some of the screens associated with the, the different modules. So it's basically the information that's being asked for in the uh, 400 forms. Uh, but I wanted to give you a flavor for what it looks like. There's on the left, it's uh, multiple sections of the form. Uh, otherwise, it would be one really long <laughs> screen that you'd have to fill it out. And so you go through different stages and there's some quality assure intelligence, quality assurance and intelligence built in to ensure that you don't enter information outside of acceptable ranges right. or physical dimensions. Um, and at the conclusion of uh, the input, then it, it provides a summary so the user can double check and then go back and make uh, adjustments if, the, if there's some maybe topographical errors or doesn't look quite right. And the same thing also for the gasoline dispensing uh, as you can see, this is a little more complex. I think on the dry cleaner, there might be only two on the left, and here we have uh, one, two, three, four, five different screens where information is being asked for. And again, this is in addition to the standard forms for the 400 PS uh, form and the SQL form. These are uh, equipment specific forms. Uh, and again, it provides a summary of the information you provided, uh, gas and dispensing 
It's a little more complicated in terms of, uh, and I'm learning new stuff on that too, the filling positions and nozzles, and they all have to match up. So that's part of the intelligence that's built into the module. So it's an extremely labor-intensive process to actually developing those tools, and not just from the development side. You know, programmers you know, have a lot of work to do, which, of course, you know, it's very labor-intensive, but even the testing of the tool is extremely labor-intensive. And every time you test, you identify, you know, a lot of bugs are going on. Huh? Anomalies. Yeah, anomalies, you know, whatever you want to call it, which is okay, you know, I mean, that's how it's supposed to do them. We take those uh, findings, you know, we uh, share them with uh, our IM folks, they go back to the drawing board, they fix them, then we test again. So we go through the iterative uh, um, uh, process. Uh, but the good news is we are making very good progress, as you can see from, um, uh, uh, from the slides. Uh, we are pretty close to that finish line, especially with the automotive spray booth tool. You know, so we are keeping our fingers crossed. We are working very close with Sad and his team. Um, in the next few weeks, we should be able to invite those folks in and uh, showcase you know, the new tool. Right? Sure. Right. Yeah. And if I can have more piece on the gasoline station uh, module, where we want to incorporate the ability to modify, uh, to have put in modifications because uh, yes. a large percentage of applications for gas and dispensing facilities are modifications, uh, as opposed to the dry cleaners and most of them are replacements. And we do have some underlying electronically uh, saved you know, information that we can right. retrieve from our databases. Right. Uh, <clears throat> so even though we are working on both tools, this one is trailing a little bit. So if we can deploy them all at once, we'll try, we'll, we'll do that. If we have to bifurcate them, you know, uh, we'll probably end up going first with the automotive spray booths and the gasoline dispensing. We'll follow maybe a couple of weeks later. Okay. So we are, we like those tools. We are hardened, you know, with uh, where we are. So we have some grand designs for next year. So uh, Amir is going to do the honor uh, yes. onto some of those suggestions. And I know many of you. Offered us, uh, Dave, you offered us some suggestions, right. you know, on the rule 2 You'll see some of them uh, making to that list. Right, so as we complete our phase one by releasing the two modules, we can now focus our attention on the second phase of our automation process. And thanks to David Barbard and others who have provided comments on what we should do, we can clearly define the goals uh, for the phase two process. Uh, I know we have basically gone over this a little bit before, but you know, we are, like I said, we're now a lot more focused on what we need to do. So what we're planning to do on, on for our second phase is to start looking at the registration applications. Uh, form two, uh, the, the forms that are being used for the rule 222, those are going to be all automated. There are about 19 different forms, and we're gonna start with the top five most used forms, and we're gonna start with those. And once our, those are developed, we will release them, and then we we'll start continuously working on the rest of those forms and complete all of the forms so that until we're all done with the Rule 222. At the same time, we're also going to be working on the certified equipment registration permits. Uh, these are the equipment that are previously certified and the applicants just for, for the registration process. Mostly is for the stationary emergency generators and also for the various location soil vapor extraction systems. For most parts, I think the majority of the cases fall for the emergency generators. We have few uh, various locations, soil vapor extraction permits that they're still trickling, but since the USD fund, the underground storage tank uh, fund uh, was depleted, we haven't received that many applications for the uh, soil vapor extraction processes. And in addition to the other two, we're also going to work on the uh, automating the remaining 400 E forms that we have. We've already automated the 400 E form for the dry cleaners. We're in the process of getting the spray boots and the gas station out. So there's going to be roughly another three, 31 forms that are remaining. And again, similar to the rule 222, we're going to be looking at the most used forms first and release them and then uh, continuously work on the remaining ones. And as they're completed, release them for use. 
And the purpose we're going to be looking at the Form 400 E-Series is because we're looking into transition to electronic filing and, pip and submittal, and also paperless processing, meaning that getting rid of the yellow folders that we have. Uh, are we going to make it mandatory for everybody to file their applications online? A question that needs to be discussed and addressed at a future time, but we're going toward that process, or at least minimizing the number of the but our, the goal is to minimize the number of the applications that we receive uh, through the mail system. I think at some time in the future it makes sense. Or will, yeah. it will. Yeah. We're thinking after some transition period, you know, I mean, you, you got to give initially, you know, options to the people. Yeah. But slowly, you know, push everyone in that direction. And after some reasonable transition period, go all electronic. Yeah. But you guys have to look at efficiency, too, in your operation. Absolutely. And I think after a while... You know, it's it's like uh, online banking or something. You right. Know, and, you know, I'm still not sold on that, but but, but there are <laughs> people yeah. do it all the time. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> you know, I think eventually it just makes sense to. Well, you know, regardless, into that. regardless whether we do online filing or not, you know, the the tools will be there, but we're very serious about transitioning to paperless permit processing, meaning we want to stop the paper being. Uh, you know, the applications coming in, you know, we can scan them or have it scanned in or already sent to us, but we want to have it in electronic files, transfer the information electronically to the engineers, have the engineers process their applications electronically, have it reviewed electronically, approved electronically, and the permits coming out electronically. So that is a, the final goal. Whether we force facilities to do online finding or not, that's something that needs to be discussed with the board and later discussions. But the goal is to go to paperless permit processing and having the ability to do everything electronically because we can then track it a lot better for the efficiency purposes. Which brings I mean, us to then, yes. Do you know what the five forms, the top forms for Fujitsu are? Yes, uh, we do, mm -hmm. but I don't have the information with, with me right now. It's so, basically the, num the, the one with the most filed okay. in the last two years. Right. I, 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 can't remember it by heart either, well, but the, uh, there are quite a few forms actually on 222. 19. We are not, huh, 19, oh, okay. Yes. We are not going to do all 19, not all at once. Our, in our first ways, we are going to shoot for the first maybe five, four or five, but they account for 95% of total 222, you know, incoming registration. I think it's char boilers. Uh, it's uh, probably the oil and wells. Oil and gas wells. And probably the two boilers. Did you say boiler? Air handling units. No, I think uh, air, air handling, yeah, air handling air units. Yeah. Well, air handling units and also the uh, the vacuums for asbestos uh, vacuum. Oh, yeah. Yeah, HEPA vacs. But those are basically the 90%. And then the next after one would be the boilers under uh, 1146.2. I mean, We'll move forward you know, with the re remaining, but at least, you know, first, you know, first we are going after the high volume ones, yeah. where we can cover the vast majority of the registration. Again, so that program, we won't need to see any paper anymore. Well, you know, you, you guys have been in business, what, 42 years, 76? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, you know, and, and, and the vast majority of your, your permit, your facilities have a single permit. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, there's just so much you can do with, 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 with a heater or with a boiler, uh, a, a furnace or a, a, a food conveyor or something like that. I mean, uh, technology changes, but not all that much. I mean, right. So if, I, I think if you were to, to seriously think about maybe registering mm -hmm. some of these pieces of equipment, Rather than going and making these with, with, with one, you know, with one piece of equipment, go through the same laborious process. Right, right. Uh, not that much new is is under the sun here. Right, in right. All these years, you must have tons of data, you know, to, to show that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Uh, no, actually, the universe, you know, the two to two uh, universe is growing very rapidly. I think. Uh, right now, you guys can correct if I'm wrong, but I think there are close to 3,000 equipment uh, registered that shifted from other what rules. used to be permitting it's other rules. into this. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the state of Texas does uh, way ahead on, on that. Right. 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 Okay. 
Yeah. So when you say, so when it calls online filing, so at the end when it's all done, does it generate an official HMD invoice? Yes, sir. Yes. Is that yes. going to be the whole? Okay. That well, if you were a dry cleaner, if you were a dry cleaner, <laughs> you insert your data in, you pay with your credit card, you push the button, and the printer prints on your printer, not from here. It's your personal printer. You get an email with your printer. You're from the first. Okay. Right. No, I understand that. I'm talking more things. like you know. But I mean, we're still a little archaic, so we're still all chat. Oh. We're still all checks. But okay, at, the end, of, at the end of the process, it'll be, and that's what I meant. It'll just be yes. the official document that you can that we can pay off of. That's what I. It also oh. has the e check. Uh, yeah, yeah. E -check. Uh, we can do e checks. We can do credit cards. You want to come with your regular check? We'll take it, Bill. No, we can take your check, give you a voucher, and then you can still file online and use a voucher number to pay for the. That's what I was curious. So yeah. it'll be the same process. That's why I was curious about yeah. it. Yeah. Is the ultimate goal here for 222 equipment to have the ability to have, get an online permit? That's Absolutely. It. Yeah. No so more no no interaction. No, no, no interaction with us. So it's clear you're going to have a lot of online forms. Everything's going to be electronic, Absolutely. which yes. is great. But I'm sort of questioning as far as you, you pick three different types of technologies you have the ability to get an online permit for as a first batch. Yes. What's next in line? Are you going to do the 222 equipment? Is the next yeah. one? Yes. Yeah. yeah. All, all these. Yeah. So, okay. so, so two, we two, are going to as soon as we deploy the automatic so. spray booth and um, uh, the gasoline station. The next day, we are starting working on those. Well, maybe within a week. We want to give our. Does <laughs> <laughs> that work for you, Ken? Okay, Five we'll days. give them a day. <laughs> oh, you mean? Sorry. <laughs> a week. <laughs> no, no, seriously. I mean, we are we are starting right away on those. Yeah. So when we come back to you next year at this time, most of these hopefully are done. Right. Yeah. So Lockheed, yes, in the past, most of the cost associated with the application fee was because you had staff time, engineering time. Now that that's going to be gone and the applicant is basically doing their own data entry and their own printing of the permit and they're generating the permit on their own, are you going to discount the application fee? After we recover you know, our development goes, of course we will. <laughs> no, it's a good question. Yeah, at some point, yeah, it will make sense. It, it's expensive to develop those tools. I, I, I'm not being facetious, um, but it's a necessary thing to do. I mean, we've got to migrate, you know, to the 21st but century. You, you develop those tools with our money, our fees. Yes, 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 yes. yes sir. So, you know, what Rita is saying, you know, if, if if there is a savings, it should come back in in a in a, in a fee refund, right? Right. So, but. Yeah, I mean, we need the development money to continue developing those, but once we have developed those, yeah, I mean, the short answer will be, of course, we'll have to uh, reflect that as savings, you know, to, uh, to the applicant. Well, Larky, I mean, as you transition, I mean, we already deal with other agencies where they will not accept any paper processing, and that's just being able to achieve those economies and recognize the savings. So it's yes. just, at some point in time, I would hope you would be moving to, I mean, it'd be some of these complete. things where it's just, that's the only choice. Otherwise, yeah. otherwise you're losing, you're, you're losing any savings you're gonna gain. That's absolutely correct. Initially, those programs may be implementing dual, maintaining dual programs. Um, Maybe even more expensive than it is right now, but at some point we'll have to force everyone in a, towards the electronic way. We are trying to be realistic here. You know, it will be. I mean, just to prepare our customers, I suppose. You know, uh, we'll have to transition slowly from one system to the other. We won't be able to do it all at once. But as uh, Bill was saying, after some reasonable transitional uh, period. We should all move 100 percent you know, to the electronic way. But you know, on, on, a, on a more serious note, one thing that is really expensive and, and has, has been a, uh, a sore point with small businesses is this expedited fee, the 50 percent. Mm -hmm. That that should go away. Well, 
yeah. I don't know if you were an applicant, say you had a dry cleaner, why would you even file for an expedited uh, uh, permit processing fee if you can get your permit in 30 minutes? Well, I don't know about dry cleaners, but I know you know that people will come up to the, the permit window there, uh -huh. and it's almost SOP. Well, if you want to get it, how long will it how long will it take before I get my permit? Well, if you want to hurry up the process, you, you need to pay an expediting fee. Okay. And and, yeah. and, and they, they take the person at their word, and then they write a check for 50% more. Well, I, I, and I'm I, not so sure. Like, that, I, that I don't know whether I agree that with that characterization, but hey, hold it though. Uh, let's discuss that last item uh, because this is the type of discussion that we want to have. What are you guys hearing versus what we are hearing? And Let's put our heads together and see you know, how we can do sure. the program. Yeah. Okay, so the next item that we're looking into developing next year would be <coughs> online application status tracking dashboard. This is something that our board wanted, and I know the industry Maybe also. A few wanted, too. Yes, industry also wants it. Uh, there will be two metrics that will be uh, tracked under this dashboard. One would be the number, the number of the days that I've had the applications has been with us since it's received and it's deemed complete. And at the, and the second point that is, or the second items that will be tracked is where the application is with the processing of the application. So if the application is stuck with asking for additional information and it ex has exceeded the 180 days, you can go on your online and take a look at it and see, oh, where am I? Oh, it's more than 180 days, why is that? I haven't maybe, they're still looking for additional information. We're looking for a source test. We're looking for CEQA, NSR. That particular query of the, or that data would be all recorded on that dashboard. And we will track it through received, assigned, uh, the status where it is until the date that its final permit is issued. So that information would be available for on an individual basis for each and every single application. Now, we would have loved to have this a little bit sooner, but as David Ono and Lucky were alluding earlier, the development of the, the first three modules have required us to do a lot more testing and a lot more attention than we have hoped, uh, which has made us to come to the conclusion that we need to continuously update and enhance the, these three modules. And as part of the second phase of this uh, our process, we are also putting some money and time aside for enhancing and updating the modules. What we're planning to do as part of this enhancement is to improve uh, our user experience <coughs> and also build in frequently asked questions that you know we find out that people are not able to uh, get it from right away from the modules so we can fix it. Uh, we want to make sure that the modules are as accurate and as simple as possible. And then we would like to test and further develop our in-house process for the applications that have been filed online, were not able to get a permit online, and are being kicked in to the agency for getting reviewed by an engineer. So those would be the items that we'll be looking toward uh, doing as part of the phase one enhancements. And that's it. Do you have any questions? I, I've got a question on, sure. on this. When, when David was taking, taking us through his portion uh, about going online where you create an account and so on. Right. So I have a, I've filed for a permit. I've, I've prepared the application and hit submit, and now it's going through the process. This tool that, that you're talking about, uh, is that going to be viewable only by by me, the permit applicant, or by everybody, the public? No, it would be available to the person who. Which tool? The uh, oh, tra the online the application online status. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Online. No, no, that no. would be available to everybody. So no, you go to our fine. Just a second. Just a second. Uh, are we asking the same? Are you referring to the dashboard tool? to see where a particular application is in the system? Yeah. Oh, I, I, yeah. I guess that's right. Oh, right, right. Oh, it's, yeah. it's like the fine. Yeah, it it's will like, be on like fine. The way you do the fine right now, this one will give you a little more um, granularity in terms of where your application is in the system, exactly. Okay. 
Can I just have one more? Yeah, sure. And I'm just trying to remember from last year, but I had thought at one point in time you were also looking at 1415 and 1415.1 yes. as being part of the yes. this initial yeah. phase. So. Yes. Uh, so it's it's not necessarily a project of this team. Right. Oh, but there's okay. another team working on it, and they're making very good progress. Uh, I think they may be going probably they're very probably soon. Probably very soon. You know? Well, yeah. Yes. Yeah, right, they're testing. Okay. Yeah. Now, the, but that whole module, portion of that module comes to engineering because we accept the applications and all that stuff. And then it's being transferred. So with the new module, all of that stuff will be done online. So there will be a lot more faster response and a lot more faster in getting your uh, acceptance. But it will process. be available to you very shortly. Yeah. Okay, very, very so shortly. That's, I, was just, I was just curious because I thought... At one time, you said it might be ready for this year, but obviously not this year. Uh, this year, I mean, 2018? I mean, I mean well, this year, this just for you. Oh, okay. yes. Oh, yeah, this is good. Yeah, that's, that's how. Okay. Yeah, yeah well, it's really doable. Yeah, well, I, I, the problem is, yeah. is you know, we've yeah. got the same group of people working on all of these programs. So, well, no, it, I was just curious. I, I, I was just curious. I just was looking through my notes and I. And so I was just curious. About I that. know they are making very good progress, yeah. and the latest thing that I heard I was talking today was that they are almost there. Because I just know that's a large batch. Of yes, I yes, yes. yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, any questions over here? Yes, um, and forgive me if you've already discussed this yeah. point. Um, and could you identify yourself? Yes, I'm Priscilla Hamilton with Sotal Gas. Um, so I um, had a question about the efforts of this task force and the transition out of these plans. Would, will this task force be aligned and work tangentially with those efforts so that this could be a forum to raise any issues or do No, maybe we can discuss it on the others and we can just yeah. finish up with the... Or we can, yeah, sure. pass I mean, it well, it's a good question. To practice, we do participate and we want to continue participating with the weekly working group meetings, but if you think that this is going to be a good forum to discuss the transition, liquid transition issues as they relate to permitting, we'll be more than happy to do it. And Lucky, you see a different process for permitting for those type of facilities? Uh, well, I all I know is, you know, there's that main working group, so I don't know. They were thinking of uh, creating subgroups. Have they been created yet? Not that I'm aware not of. That you, no. Not that I'm aware of either. You know, so, so we are open to go either I mean, way. Like we, we just got the transition plan what, yeah. right. so, a few uh, weeks ago. Uh, so. uh, we could, <coughs> yeah. Maybe. Uh, it's a good idea. Yeah. 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 And from our vantage, uh, from our side, you know, we won't have any issue with it. If you guys want to want to sure. I mean, just as far as how long it takes to process and bog sends down. No problem. That's pertinent. No problem. It's a good suggestion. Uh, let, let me bring it up internally, you know, and maybe we, this this can be our de facto, you know, subgroup. I mean, and it's going, to have, it's going to have an, an impact uh, on the entire permitting process anyway. Right. So. Right. Makes sense. Makes sense. Have a major impact. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, these are excellent improvements to the website. I've noticed. I don't know if it's just me, I've asked around, that the website has slowed down <laughs> immensely. I don't know <coughs> if this has anything to do with that. Probably not. No. And it, I'm just wondering if anyone else is experiencing that. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it is. Okay. <laughs> I don't like new websites. I'm improve it. This is a new improvement. Yeah. 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 Is very intelligent. <laughs> 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 I haven't looked at put the calendar under calendar like it was before. Now you have to go to another drop down menu to find the calendar. I missed that. Okay. Yeah, okay. at sure. least. I'll tell you about it. Hold your horses. Next meeting. <laughs> uh, Sad's boss, you know, was planning actually to join us at the meeting today, and I. Try to discourage them. I said, don't worry, we are not getting into the details of the online tools today. If he makes meeting, perhaps. <laughs> so, when he's here, you know, he would be very interested in hearing some of the things that you guys are saying. Next meeting, one of us will be designated to bring a rope. It just slows everything down. I, I, don't know, whatever. I know we had some issues, you know, 
uh, at the very initial stages of the deployment, things got progressively better, but you're saying you're still exp experiencing some Literally, stuff. I mean, if I, if I go into the rules a lot, if I have to go into the rules, I mean, I would click, and I literally will go get myself a copy. I'm, I'm noticing, one of my members I mean, said something similar, especially for permitting, uh -huh. you can get your form and try to open a form. Uh -huh. It's, at least on my computer, it's pretty, pretty quick. It's a good 10 seconds to just load, and then when you go to the next form, you think that page is fully loaded. No, it does the same thing again. Right. It's, yeah. a page, it's, it's a page issue. It will not load the entire page. Huh. So if you're going into the rules, you go into your reg, you know, uh -huh. reg, whatever, yeah. you click on that, and you think, oh, I'm going to scroll down on my mouse. Yeah. It's like, uh, it's right. nothing to go so I'd be happy. It's the special feature that we introduced for you to to allow you to do your breathing exercises. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I mean. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll take it back. Okay. okay. Um, next step. So next item. So are we on item number five? Yes. So the expedited permit program. All right. So I don't have to. Uh, explain the history you know, of this program, right? You know, we, we have been um, implementing this program for, God, more than 10 years, almost 15 years plus, you know, perhaps. Uh, uh, mostly happy customers, I would say, you know, uh, and some not so much. Uh, and what we hope, and perhaps, you know, you can, Amir, you can explain how the program works a little bit. Um, and our goal today, we don't have any stats or any slides that we want to share with you. Uh, what we're hoping we can do today uh, is uh, to hear you out. You know, what are some of the issues that you guys are hearing? Um, are they the same with the ones that you were hearing? I don't know, a year ago, because uh, it's a little bit different today than it was a year, a year and a half ago when we have a permit uh, backlog. Um, uh, at 7,500 plus. Uh, so, uh, but regardless, uh, we want to hear you out and perhaps we can take some of those messages back. Maybe we can do some data mining to bring back some stats, you know, on next go around and try to figure out how we can improve things if we still need to, uh, things need to be improved. So, I mean, the, yeah. do we need to uh, explain story, how explain the XPT works uh, or? Do we feel I mean, just the question you're going to get is kind of evaluation of, I have to pay so much more, what do I get for that? Mm -hmm. And it's nebulous right now as far okay. as how, right. how much And I guess, I mean, from our perspective, we have always been happy with the program. The XPT? We, yeah. Okay. When we've used it, we've always gotten what we needed, and on the rare occasions when they couldn't do it within whatever the guidelines are, we've actually had the additional money is refunded. Mm -hmm. So we've never had an issue with the program okay. since it started. Just in that, but yeah. I can always okay. speak from Boeing's right. Our right. perspective. Right. So. To be frank with you, I've been doing this for the last, how long has it been, 20 months, 21 months now. Uh, and I very rarely uh, get any negative feedback. In these last 20 months, Maybe I got one phone call, maybe two, you know, for folks who apply for XP and they didn't get the permits, you know, on time or they didn't feel they were they got the benefit of uh, their investment, and and truly, you know, the permit took a lot longer, you know, to process than what we normally take, and we looked at, and there are typically, you know, two culprits. Um, uh, and the police, you know, either on our side, you know, I mean, the information came in and for whatever reason we didn't cost some time, or sometimes the information will not come in from the applicant. So we try to assess, you know, okay, who's the guilty party over here? And guess what? You know, it was on our end, uh, the guilt. So we ended up, you know, uh, reimbursing uh, 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 the fellow back. But very few, you know, of those examples. So if you know, if I, I'm starting a process to improve the problem, I wouldn't even know where to start. That's why I want to have the conversations going, you know, just to hear from you guys, you know, what you guys are hearing. So, that, you know, we have something to shoot for. Yeah. With the, with the folks that, that I represent, uh -huh. uh, it, it, 
lot different. Uh, Boeing's, uh, the gas company, Edison, uh, probably the scat boats, they're not going, I would, I would expect to, to, to hear that they got full value uh -huh. for their, ex, for being in the expedited budget program. For small businesses, the last thing that they would want to do is to alienate the permit guy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, or do anything that's going to trigger. They've got equity in the ground or equity in the building, and all they want to do is get that permit, put it up there, open their doors, and operate legally. So I get a, a number of complaints mm -hmm. uh, from these types of facilities, and believe me, you guys aren't, aren't going to be receiving them. Because they don't want to draw attention to themselves, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it, uh, I, I, you know, if you're digging up okay. numbers or figures uh -huh. for stats, they're going to be skewed because the majority of those folks aren't going to complain. Mm -hmm. They're just not. Mm -hmm. They will to somebody like me mm -hmm. over a cup of coffee or something right, like that. Right. Right. But, okay. And, and how you rectify that, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. Let me ask you in a different way. Um, I remember when we were brainstorming just around about you know when we started the backlog reduction effort, this last effort. Um, I remember you guys had suggested that we put this on our drawing board, on our to-do list. And one suggestion that I had was, you know, okay, let us work first on the backlog reduction. Let's uh, place this for towards the tail end of this fiscal year, because as the backlog you know comes down, as it frees up more engineers' time, perhaps the engineers will have more time to work on those applications. You know, you know we won't even need you know, as many ex XPPs. Uh, so, and I don't know how we can test that theory. Did things get any better? I mean, it, can we even ask the question to the same folks you know, that were talking to you? Uh, I mean if they are still engaged with us uh, and seeking XPPs, I mean, are things got any better or are the issues the and same? That's kind of where I'm coming from is typically you have a project, you need to get it done immediately, mm -hmm. you just pay the fee. Yeah. But as far as do you get any additional speed with yes. that as an applicant, you don't know. Okay. Right? Yeah. That's okay. the problem is assessing is okay. it faster or not. Got it, got it, got it, got it. There are a few things that we can do. I mean, we can... We know how long a permit takes to be issued, you know. Uh, so we can go back and query, you know, our databases and maybe come up with some stats to see um, how long it takes on average, you know, to process an XPP permit versus a non-XPP and do the comparison and see is that any benefit or not. Uh, we should be able to retrieve some of the information and bring it here. You know, that, that, that 7,500 or whatever the number is yes. of permits, there, there had to be some number of those, some percentage of those permits yes. that paid yeah. the expedited fee. Uh, so uh, that, that should give you some data, yes. maybe, maybe uh, historical data, not prospective data, but historic data as to, you know, did, did those people get what they paid for? Yes. You know, or did okay. they have to wait any, anyway? Okay. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> Let us go back and try to retrieve some numbers and bring them here and take a look at them. I'm trying to think whether we can look at different calendar years. To, uh, it would be interesting for me to see whether whatever the processing time is for XPP versus non-XPP, <laughs> have we seen any improvement over time. And if you go back a year ago, yeah. the concern that was being expressed why this is a big deal uh -huh. was there was some perception, true maybe false, uh -huh. as far as because of the way the XPP system was set up, it could actually be slower getting expedited permit at a certain point in time. And that was a big concern if yeah. that was actually true. Uh -huh. I'll doubt that very much, but is there a goal as far as the length of time? I'm sorry? It, do you guys have an internal goal as far as when you get a, an expedited application, you'll issue it within X number of days? I mean, is there an internal metric? Well, let me, okay, so let, let's address some of these issues. So when the 
program was developed back in late 1990s, early 2000. You know, we originally, and it, and it came as a recommendation from this body to have the expedited processing. <coughs> originally, we were only looking at directing applications only for minor sources. But the way things worked out, we ended up having it both for minor sources and major sources. There are, so when we <coughs> get an application in-house for expedited permit processing, that application moves to the head of the line when it's, the information is being received and the folders are being created. So it bypasses the normal, even though our normal basic goal, business goal is to have four days to develop a folder from the time the application is received, expedited permits actually maybe it's 50% of that time. Then it gets quickly moved to the teams and it gets assigned to an engineer to work on it on a voluntary basis. And the reason we wanted to, for the voluntary basis was that so there would be no uh, special accommodation because you paid more versus somebody who didn't have the money and did not pay them more, more money. So we only do it on an overtime basis if the person is available. And if the person is not available to do it, or there is not, you know, we, we, the length of the time exceeds, and I know I've done it myself with my teams when I was a manager, we refunded the money. We called the facilities up and said, look, we just don't have the staff to process this application expedited as you had requested. Would you like us to refund your money or and put you back into the normal queue, or you want us to still wait? So we can't really give a, num a date number or date or number of days to process an XPP applications because it's being done on a voluntary basis based on the availability of staff. And we don't want to do it during regular times because we want to make sure we, we address all the applicants the same way. So we take those uh, XPP applications and pull it out and work on it on the weekend. But once it's at work, again, it goes through the review process based on an expedited process. So that means, again, the, the reviewer is not doing it on the weekdays. They're coming in on the weekends looking at it or off hours looking at it. And then when it goes back upstairs for the permits to be issued, it gets priority process. So those are the first permits that goes out as soon as the permit services receive those applications. So those are the, uh, the stuff that you don't see and that is happening in-house, but that's what really works with the XPP process. But I guess where I was going with this, if, if you get a permit in in January and, right. and, and at, at best you get it out in June. Mm -hmm. Then that's what's an XPP. But, but I, no, but but then you know that's that's my expectation. But then the, then they were told, well, if I pay fifty percent more, I might be able to get it out around March or April. And uh -huh. So that's what I'm saying is right. is for for those permits yeah. there, yeah. those people that filed in January or uh -huh. or due in June, but they didn't get it till September right. of that year or maybe the next year. You know that that's the kind of right data I think mm -hmm. that, that I would be looking for I okay think. sure but there's a problem with that data right. so you know even if we pull that data so because the data gets skewed you know if an FPP application came in that there was no issues with it there was no public noticing all the information was there we were able to get a hold of the applicant there was no sequel issues we were there was and uh, we have all the data versus an application that comes in as an FPP and believe me there is a lot of larger facilities a father application on XPP, and they sit in the bin for a year or two because there are SQL issues, there's noticing issues, there's information that we need. So when, when we pull that data out, the data may not be all that representative because we don't have the ability to go back and go, oh, 50% of these applications that we received, even though it took them, you know, were done within the 60 or 30 days, but we can go and identify the rest of them, yeah. whether they got stuck because of one reason or another. Now, when we do the dashboard, mm -hmm. then we have a better control over what is the problem and where is it stuck. I, see, I, I reject I reject that. Your, your hypothesis that, because then I'm stuck with David, is what benefit do I get for that? Right. You know, he, you, you, it, it's expedited, however, right. subject to the CEQA, to public noticing, yes. subject to this, that. So, you, you should have not used uh, no, individually. But should there's have nothing stuff. that we can do on that end, though. No, but I'm saying whoever whoever accepts that money, the people at the permit counter or whoever it is, should have said it won't do you any good. And we no, do it, it will that. still do you good. If, if we get enough, <coughs> I get I get many applications for spray boosts that are expedited. 
Um, so many so that I have engineers that during regular time don't do that kind of work, but they come in on weekends because the people that normally do that work can't possibly do all the expedited straight through applications. And say at a certain time, one of the applications on regular processing, assuming the facility has complete application and, and we don't have any, any problems debating with the facility on conditions or anything like that, and say it would take six weeks. If there's a public notice, that's going to add a month and a half. And there's, you know, that's a requirement of the law. There's nothing we can do about that. But if, they, if that same application came in and expedited, and getting to the point of doing the public notice takes two weeks instead of six, yet there's still that six weeks added on, but they saved four weeks of the engineer's work time. Um, so if, if a facility recognizes I'm near a school yeah. and I have to do a public notice anyway, so it's not going to help me, then they shouldn't right. shouldn't file it. So there, there's just there's nothing we can do about it, but it. That doesn't mean that it's not saving them time. Let us, of the time that can be expedited. Let data. us pull some data. Now, and I understand what you are saying, Amir, uh, that the averages may be skewed by some, you know, outliers, and maybe instead of just showing average figures, maybe we can show how the sample population. Yeah, let me look at the All mean. what Bill is trying to get to is, if I understood him correctly, at least for the majority of the applicants of uh, the XPP applicants, are they getting any return to their investment or not? I mean, can we have statistics that will show, yes, they're getting some benefit, or no, they are not getting any benefit, you know, or at least, you know. <laughs> Or, or, Am I understanding it correctly? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, or, or maybe listening <coughs> to Mitch here, maybe, maybe the uh, the decision to to expedite or not to expedite mm -hmm. should be made later on in the process, not at the time of initial filing. Once the permit engineer, whoever whoever receives, whoever gets this application, has a chance to look at it and say, "Uh oh, you're." You're within 900 feet of a school, not a uh, thousand. Or you know, there's a sequel issue, or, 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 some, or some other issues mm -hmm. uh, that are that are involved. So uh, now you have you have a choice: two weeks or three weeks into the process <laughs> of either expediting or not expediting. Well, so that means that you know when we receive the application. So he, well, here's the, the negative part. I mean, I, I, I'm just right. throwing that so, out. Yeah, right. we don't. Yeah, we're, no, this is a this we're out loud. Right. So then, uh, when it comes in, then it will go through the normal process of going through our business for getting the folders created. Then you know, if you, I don't know if you guys recall or not. Initially, initially when the program was developed, we were doing time and material instead of a fixed cost. And that was got rejected, and we had lots of complaints about it. And that's why we moved to this whole process. So it's okay, you know how much it costs at the beginning, so you don't have to worry about you know we are charging you any more than what you anticipate. But we need to move the application through the process from the beginning to the end. So that's where the problem is that you know if I start moving the applications quicker, what about the other people who didn't put that expedited form in there? You know, am I, uh, you know, are we doing a disservice to them because we didn't know that they wanted to, you know, it, so the, we didn't know whether they wanted to expedite or not. And then now we have to sit down and make that additional phone call. Well, you know, you, I see an expedited form in here. Are you really want to make an expedited process or not? It's going to, you know, so. So, well, I, I mean, know. historically, right. we've done, we process both ways. So, uh, so we know the type of time frames we we're dealing with. And uh -huh. so we, historically, what we've seen in the process is when we don't expedite, we see a big holdup at the front end before it ever gets to the engineer, and, big, and a big chunk of time at the end of the process after it's left the engineer. Uh -huh. I mean, uh -huh. I, I have permits that 
then a fairly complex paint boot permit has been done in less than two weeks, but uh, <coughs> but then it gets held up for some. If I had one complaint about the, about the whole system, it's right. we get we get a permit through really quickly, and then I think there was a period of time where it was just sitting a long time for management approval, and I yeah. think that might have been because yeah. there was a shortage of managers at the time, but. <laughs> uh -huh. But I mean, but yeah, we've seen the difference on how they're processed. Yeah. And, and so there is a difference. Uh, that difference was very stark before. And I'm not trying to tell you that we made that difference disappear, but the delta, you know, shrank down today. I mean, both the front end and the back end, we are trying to shorten those, you know, and we'll probably be able to retain that assuming that we will continue our success with our uh, pen uh, application inventory, keeping it at the low levels that it is. Um, um, but anyhow, I, I think I can hear you guys out. And well, I, I may yes. add, yes. the important limitation and distinction of that this program is the nature of the project. Yes. If you, if you, as Amir was describing, the XPP is worked on the weekends only, and that's generally at a maximum 20 hours. And that's only during this backlog reduction. Normally it's 10 hours. So if you have a project and it's large scope, and, and Bill, if you have some of those long process lines you know, for the chrome plating, for instance, if you, it's going to take you 100 hours. That's going to take you 10 weeks. Yeah. Whereas if you're doing it on a 40 hour week, well, you can do the math. It's yeah. two and a half weeks. So Getting it to the front of the line, as Amir described, does benefit, as Mitch was describing, automotive spray boots. But in the case of a, a larger, complex project, you know, it all bets are off. I guess in simple. I, I, I hear I hear what you're saying, but uh, you know, let, let me say this: that my folks don't care. Uh, so we when, realize when, 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 yeah, we really, yeah. uh, you know, when 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 they when they fill out a permit app when they come in here. Uh, for another island of gas pumps or another paint booth or another dichromate line or something like that. The dichromate line, the, the, <clears throat> the metal finisher, in all likelihood has either been on a job uh, or has a contract to use that. Because some of these lines are a million dollars, you know, easily. Uh, the, gas, uh, the gas station, people have the gas station on a corner. They want, they've got They've got equity in there. They want to start using those as soon as possible, legally. And the guy with the auto body shop, he obviously, that's either his second paint booth or it's an upgraded paint booth. So he wants to do that to recover his investment. You know, this thing about voluntary versus involuntary over time, or 20 hours versus 10 times, they don't care. Now, that's not to say that you don't have your issues, but... Your, your customers have, have, we have our issues too. And, and you know, if we can find some middle ground through technology or whatever it is, that's fine. But. Well, no doubt the technology will help. Oh, sure. Know, we are yeah. uh, doing over here. <clears throat> yeah. But the limitations there is it's virtually impossible to develop online tools, technology, technology based tool for all the different processes. Yeah. You know? Definitely, it's not going to happen overnight. Yeah, still uh, there are so there are certain variables, and Amir, Mitch, and Ed, you know, they mentioned it. You know, there are certain variables that we cannot control. For instance, if the project will trigger CEQA, if the project will need to do uh, modeling, if the project will need to bring in ERCs that may be difficult to purchase, you know, find out in the market. If um, uh, if the project will trigger public noticing, these are inflexible variables that we cannot control. We can only control, you know, what the engineer once the engineer has all those, you know, inputs and how long he or she is going to spend in uh, processing, you know, uh, that information. We can control that, and all I'm saying is we are definitely doing a lot better job today than we were doing two, three, four years back. You know, and we can continue doing that, and we can improve upon that. So, so with, with those very real barriers that you have, that you just described, mm -hmm. maybe certain permit app, apps for permits don't qualify. 
for an expedited process. Yeah. I mean, right. They just fall out right. because of these variables that, right. that, that you can't get around. The, the only problem that we have is we can tell up front whether a particular project will trigger all those variables. I think, you know, those get triggers once the yes, engineer sir. starts, you know, evaluating the process and also they realize, oh, this is going to trigger an admission increase and you're not qualified to go under yeah, our right. community yeah, bank. You've got to go out to the to market and get earlier. ERCs. Maybe that, that's the point I was trying to make earlier. Maybe that, that, that question or that decision by the applicant, mm -hmm. you know, should be made a couple of weeks into the process after the engineers had a, had a chance to, to look at that. So, here's the I problem. think, I, I, no, no, I understand what you're saying. <laughs> but here's the problem. And he tried to explain that when that application comes in, it all depends how that engineer's inbox look like. You know, if he has a short stack, probably in two weeks he may be able to get into that particular application. If it looks anything like this, it goes, you know, to the very bottom, right? Uh, and the poor applicant, you know, will keep waiting up until you know his turn comes in. By the time his turn comes in, it may be too late for the guy. Well, then that's when you go knock on the lane door and say, "Hey, I need help down here." Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> the good news is, <laughs> the good news is, what we are trying to do through uh, this backlog production is to bring the working inventory down to manageable, manageable level, so each engineer has. X number of applications, uh, which is a number, number large enough to keep that person busy, uh, but not too large, you know, that it's overwhelming, you know, and we are getting to uh, those permit processing issues that we've been getting into for the last 30 years. I know this That's, is all, it's very complicated, you have yeah. a lot of things that could slow it down. Right. It'd almost be nice to say, Okay, applicant, here's your choices, uh, and have a, almost a disclaimer saying if you take the regular permitting path, uh -huh. currently on yeah. our forecast, it'll take you yeah, maybe six months if you do expedited, and you don't have these problems, yeah. it may take you two months. Fire okay. beware if you have these roadblocks, we'll right. let you know, but that could slow it down. I don't know if that's another way to do it. Yeah, it, it will it's, be difficult to give them. <laughs> specific days, you know, right. specific time frames, um, because each, each project is very different. And one key variable that we talk about, uh, that we talked about a little bit earlier, is often where things get stuck is if the permit engineer asks for information, you know, and that information is not forthcoming. And often, you know, they talk past each other. Uh, and the project basically ends up lingering, you know. So we gotta figure out a solution to that problem. Uh, because the, where we are, I mean, we are reaching a sweet spot, you know, with our inventory, permanent inventory. Um, if that information keeps coming in, you know, we should be able to process those permits in a reasonable time, and we shouldn't have, you know, the issues that we had, you know, way in the past. Well, I think one of the, the issues as I listen to the discussion is the uh, the access to the engineer. First of all, you're making on a voluntary basis, so uh -huh. you really have no way of predicting who's going to volunteer for that yeah. particular time. And then you're only giving the expedited applicant or the application access to the engineer for the weekend hours, yes. which could be 10 to 20. Okay. So if, if you reconsider the policy yeah. of, you know, once you have okay. it expedited, yeah. work on it. Work on it, you know. During so, the week, okay. work on it. On the weekend, and take out some of the uh, some of the. That will help. I, I can almost guarantee you that will help with the processing time. Uh, the only problem, the only caveat, and you guys can correct me. This was way before my time when these policies were were developed. Uh, our board and certain board members. Um, uh, we're extreme, extremely concerned that this XPP program, the way it was being implemented, what it, it was going to help those folks, you know, who could afford to pay the extra 50%, um, that that help would have come at the expense 
of the regular permit applicants who couldn't afford to go the extra fee route. And they wanted to kick these two universes out and have our engineers, you know, during their 40 hours, work on the regular permits and have engineers who were willing to volunteer to work on an OT basis during the weekends to work on those XP applications only during the weekend. If the board is okay with us bending that a little bit, I don't think staff will have any issue. But it's a discussion that we'll have to have with the board and you guys can be very persuasive. I mean, it can be one avenue, right? It's not an expense of somebody. Right. The regular right. guy who didn't pay the 50%. And I don't know if it's fair. It's a matter of fairness. Well, you know, I mean, if I can't afford it, why should I wait? You because you can. more, you get a better service. I know it's well, a non guys, but the goal is, Yeah, but the goal agency. is not to, but, but see, our goal at this point, as far as the agency is concerned, is to get to the point where we don't need to do an expedited permit processing. Yeah, what, 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 and that, I think that should be kept in mind. This has been a year and a half now, but can anybody remind me, or if we knew in the first place, uh -huh. what were the factors that caused this backlog, this 7,500 7, backlog? You're smiling. <laughs> I don't want to go there. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to look back. I want to look forward. <laughs> uh, but you got to learn from history, right? So we, so we, we don't do. repeat it, it again. Look, we are working smarter. We are working harder, but we are working smarter. All right. Okay. Uh, and we are trying to modernize. You know, so uh, there is no one single reason or one single rule. We we'll let you know there are a number of different things that uh, we have to do, and we are doing, and. Basically, you know, our productivity is higher today, you know, than it was two years ago, okay? And the short answer, that's basically what propelled us in reducing the backlog and bring it down to the level. And so long as we stay alert, you know, eyes on the ball, we should be able to maintain that. At least we are demonstrating with our common resources, we didn't change people, it's the same people, right? The same folks, you know, working on the permits. That's doable. All we have is to stay focused, you know, um, on the mission. Maybe it's easiest to go and say, we've enough of a population of permits and say, year by year, how long did it take, one versus the other? Yes. And you get in outliers. Yeah. On the hey, I, large enough population. That's what we'll try to do, uh, if it's doable. We'll see, you know, yeah. the quality of the data that we have at hand and Absolutely. bring it over and we'll both look sense. at the same data and see whether we can tease off uh, sure. a few. Uh, lessons and suggestions. Guys, I didn't turn back now. Any suggestions? Come on. You got it. <laughs> right? That's right. Yeah. No? No? Uh, you want to keep it? Okay. <laughs> Very good. All right. All right. Well, this is good. I mean, and look, we are not going to solve it in one session or two. Uh, if you don't mind, especially Bill, you, since you are dealing with a uh, with the small businesses and stuff. You should improve them again, you know? I mean, are they having the same issues today that they have in two years? Are those same issues persist? Did they change nature? It will be useful information. You know, let's bring it to the table and we'll figure something out. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I think that this is an excellent group here. So yeah. It really is. Yeah. And, and we're doing good work here. So. Too bad uh, the other bill, Bill Quinn, is not here because that was an item high in his agenda as well. Bill Quinn of C. Uh, what? C Bill, C Bill Quinn of yeah. C. Yeah. Uh, him too, who had brought this issue up. Oh. But we missed him. So we'll, we'll have it next time. Well, the conversation continues. Yeah. Yeah. Next, yeah. So that's all we have for today. Um, Did you get through second item number four? four? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Other topics? Oh, the other topics? Uh, that's where we are. Uh, what happens? Uh, see, this is uh, the modern math. We go from five to four. You know. It was four, five, four. Yes. So, yes. Second number four. Yeah. Second number four. Yes, I feel absolutely. So, um, one of the issues that we have talked about, and I know we have a back meeting uh, coming up, is that we have some previous back. Yes. Uh, in our state community mm -hmm. and at the state resource committee is the interplay between the permitting team and the back Again, team. Yes. Any developments on that? Absolutely. The communication, you know, has improved, you know, 100%. You know. <laughs> no, seriously. 49% improvement in communication. 
just all a matter of timing and priority, you know? uh, uh, but uh, it, it is on our to-do list, and uh, we can better it will, um, it will get better. You jog my memory uh, on the other topics. I have one topic that I would like to share with those folks. So we are in the process of amending our REC3, and we talked about uh, uh, one provision that we're introducing to um, as we, to address the recruitment transition issue. Uh, there's another item uh, that deals with permit streamline a little bit, and it will mostly help folks who are Title V permits, perhaps. Uh, some of you, yeah, uh, uh, many of you are using SCR services, right? You know, in your facilities, uh, or not, not you, huh? Yes, you do. Yes. Cool. <laughs> 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 uh, so, or you are using control devices with catalysts uh, that you often replace, and sometimes you want to replace them with the equivalent catalyst. And normally, uh, the way we'll, we'll uh, deal with you, we'll, with the way we'll treat you, is we'll ask you know to submit a permit application to tell us what the equivalent catalyst is. Uh, and take it through the process. Uh, we are trying to formalize a process that will not require you to submit a permit application, but we are developing some forms where you will basically be able to submit your existing catalyst parameters versus uh, the new catalyst. And to the extent we can demonstrate the equivalency there, we may be able to give you the thumbs up uh, without having to take it through the formal permit amendment process, which, as you know, if it's a Title V, you got to go through a significant permit amendment, public process, CPA review, and blah, blah, blah. So we may be able to bypass that. Um, so, But it is still for us. It's a resource-intensive uh, process. So we are introducing a provision to recoup our cost, our review time. But it's not going to be uh, a formal permit amendment. You know, so. What are we calling it, Danny? I can't remember you know, or just, today. Just do you remember? Approval. Okay. Approval. All right. So it's on the REC3 proposal uh, that is out in public, you know, so you guys can take a look at it, you know, and uh, I just wanted to give you a heads up. Yeah, so I said you had to say it's an Thank you. Uh, so if we're moving forward with SCRs, if we are, yeah. and uh, would that be like a permit type condition that will require to this approval mechanism? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, yeah. so you'll find it helpful, you know, I'm pretty sure, you know, so at least, you know, it's now formally going to be embedded in REC3, you know, so. One th yes, sir. Quick issue on the automation. I have one member that uh, said for the forms, when you fill them out electronically, just the fillable PDFs, that it's, the fields are fairly narrow and you're not able to go elsewhere in the document to have a title or something. Is there any way to free up more space? I understand you can't have people change the document itself. Right. But it, there's the problem is that there was, it's a fillable form. When we go electronic, it would be you expand as much as you want in there. Yeah. It, it, it's it, those forms that when they were created, I think right. they But we have to go back and give me the name, the, the form number. Let's see if we can make some changes. Okay. I mean, it's just more of they have, people want to be able to say, oh, I want to put a title on, yeah. make it easier for the engineer right. looking through the application yeah. to see what it is. Right. So it's just a little more flexibility. Yeah, so the ones that we are working on will be much smarter forms, you know. Um, and I don't know whether they'll be smart enough. If we have our way, we would like them not only to be submitted to us electronically, but also have us communicate with our inventories and the different databases that we have. We'll see, you know, we, whether we can get to that point. But at a minimum, they should be able to give you that ability to put in more information. Additional, I mean, maybe something that doesn't be, populate your database, right. but just yeah. additional information. No, this, this, this will be web-based form, so yeah. quite different from the 
forms that you have right now. So these fillable forms, you can submit it. Right. You can to you can print it, attach it, uh, send it to us electronically, but right now it doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, oh. Yes. Uh, going back to your um, that uh, Lex Lee amendment about mm. the SDR and those type of um, mm -hmm. yeah. change-ups. I know I may be asking for too much, but um, like in an ideal permit for um, the swimming would be. If you change, like, from the, S the catalyst or carbon, um, any sort of, like, you know, uh, treat media, packing media, uh -huh. we make a change, and a lot of times we have to get permits to modify. Um, if there's enough flexibility to open the permit in the first place, as long as we meet the emission limits, um, you know, then um, we should have the flexibility to change out the carbon media, type of media that we, we think that's going to work better or cheaper. Um, we may be able to expand what we are doing with the catalyst to that, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about not even going through that, you know, uh, approval <clears throat> process. Uh -huh. Yeah, if um, I be saying for for facilities, an ideal permit would be so that we can make the changes without having to go through a kind of approval process or permitting process. Uh -huh. um, as long yeah. as we know we write the specs so that we're not going to exceed the permit requirements. I guess um, the per. The permit would establish the floor, and yes. if you go above that, and if you go above that of equivalent, it shouldn't matter. Moving to toward more of a performance standard. I mean, you are trying to achieve standard, whatever, whatever it is. is. You're you're, in, you're assured that you have a performance standard that you shall meet, uh -huh. whatever it may be. And, and then, we've, yeah, we've had examples where you actually want to make a change that's going to improve our process, but then you know um, the permit was holding you know us back. Uh -huh. doing that. I mean, that, you know, we have some examples like that. But I mean, Did you file it to that permit? No. Just kidding. I'm hoping to, you know, maybe you know, kind of think outside the box. Okay, sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, good suggestion. Anything else? When are we going to do this again? Uh, we're very we're soon, doing. actually. Uh, so, I guess our next meeting. So we do this quarterly, but very likely our next meeting will be a lot sooner than that because if we're lucky enough you know, to be able to finish uh, the automotive spray booth um, uh, online tool in the next few weeks, maybe in a month's time, you know, we'll call another meeting. Uh, and Priscilla had a, a full point that she made about replay too. So. Uh, you, you, you right, would, you yeah, would maybe to, we'll use that, yeah. You would need to work, work right, that right, right. So we are, we are doing a lot of work internally on the Ritman transition as far as, you know, permitting is concerned. Maybe if we'll be able to finish, we'll probably have a presentation at the next working group meeting, which is on the 11th of April, or thereabouts, yeah. okay. Um, if not, or in addition to, maybe we'll have, we'll use this group as a sub-working group. And you have some draft permits. <laughs> you have some draft permits? Yeah. <laughs> we are looking at you. Yes, we're actually looking at you. That's what I mean. Yeah. Actually, we, we use some of your permits, um, uh, and not just yours, you know, some others, to come up with the fee schedule, actually. Yeah, so, we're going to make comments about the fee schedule. Okay. <laughs> Uh, all right. Uh, any public comments? Going once, going twice. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Web page too. So we've noticed some turns on that. It's much faster on the Pro than on the and also. It's it's not in the original, but it's much faster.